Mirror to DC Today. Uh, it is Wednesday afternoon, February the 7th, and uh, good to be with you. Another nice positive trading day uh, in markets today, frankly, without a lot of economic news. So I guess uh, no news is good news these days. Um, look, the Fed's pretty clearly on hold for the time being. Earnings are coming out. We're about 80% through uh, Q4 earnings, and they're better than expected. Um, you know, growth rate of around 6% or so for the quarter. And uh, we're looking at, you know, an estimate at least of about 11% for 2024. So all that to say, mar markets are, are, uh, are, are doing fine. The volatility index continues to move lower. It's just sort of a complacent market, really. VIX is in the 12s now. And uh, we closed almost in the, um, in the 5,000 range on the S&P. The Dow is up, like I said, 156 points. 10-year was up a basis point or two at 412. Um, so all in all, uh, I'll chalk it up to, to a decent day without a lot of economic data to drive it. Um, there was uh, some uh, deficit numbers that were out today that were largely expected. We uh, uh, ran about a $62.2 billion deficit for the month of December, which puts the total 2023 year uh, right around $1.7 trillion. And what I wrote is, just keep in mind, that's with full unemployment or full employment and um, and uh, earnings growth and positive GDP, real GDP of about 3.1%. So it's pretty stunning numbers, uh, really. Um, but um, there was, um, you know, a little bit of historical data I would, I would cite. You know, the, the Fed um, raising rates and then staying on hold before cutting, technically, historically, has actually been a little better for stock returns. Usually they're starting to cut interest rates because economic data is driving them to try to, um, you know, stimulate the economy and and uh, and help things uh, help cushion the blow of, of what usually is a declining economic environment. And that's not what we're seeing here. So so not not all bad with uh, with the Fed sort of staying on hold for a little while. David had a nice section in there on on uh, what's on David's mind. I thought, which I've read that quote for many times as well. But it's just reminiscent of another era that that isn't exactly the same as is this one in technology and some of these technology stocks, but it certainly rhymes. So this was Sun Microsystem CEO, Scott McNeely talking about his stock price at $64 a share and how it was trading at 10 times revenue. And then he went on to say things like, just understand if I distributed 100% of earnings for the next 10 years in a row without any sort of cost structure or paying employees or R&D or or you know any expense or paying taxes, even then that would just be um, pricing in what you've currently priced in today. So it's just sort of ridiculous. And the comment was sent with um, with another uh, earnings report today on on a company called Snap, um, which is a social media company that uh, was down thirty percent on the day, because sometimes these things are just priced to perfection. Okay, so so it's hard for any sort of actual results in real life to live up to those expectations. Number one. And then number two, just that valuations matter here. You know, the the starting point on when you buy something, even if it's a great company, and, and neither of us, David nor myself, are saying any of these businesses. Um, well, I'll set Snap aside for a sec. But but uh, when you look at you know the Mag Seven companies, for example, you know it's not that they're bad companies. They're great companies. They're great franchises. They're they're you know um, you know part of the fabric of the U.S. at this point. You know these big tech companies. So there's nothing wrong with them. They're great. It's more just you know, they can be something like a Cisco or a Microsoft when you buy them in 2000 and it takes 15 to 20 years to sort of get back to where, you know, you were priced to perfection. And so that's just something to keep in mind. And I think it's a valid point and a good one. Um, the um, Ask Brian section I put in there today was a very a good question. It was sent from someone asking about interest rates. And, and basically, even if, you know, inflation is coming down, um, you know, he, he intuitively and, and rightfully so was thinking that rates would stay higher just because of the amount of indebtedness and deficits that are being run. And it, and, and it is a segue into the number we got out today on that deficit number. But um, I put a link in there um, about what we've written several times about what we've called Japanification, which is that higher amounts of indebtedness um, you know, lead to lower growth. And so lower growth often begets um, lower interest rates and more indebtedness to try to stimulate and manufacture growth. But since you've already borrowed that growth from future 
it, it is just sort of a self-fulfilling cycle of, of a lower growth paradigm. And in those environments, the interest rate paradigm tends to be lower, not higher. And you've seen that in Japan for 30 years. You've seen it in Europe. And I would say that uh, um, a difference between those two areas and the U.S. is a demographic one with uh, the population um, being stagnant or, or declining in, in some of the others and still growing, at least in the U.S. And so I'll say that there's some difference there. But, but generally speaking, um, you know, larger amounts of global indebtedness are, are something that detracts from growth. And so, um, you know, in, in, a, in the other part that I wrote about was that th this doesn't happen in a vacuum. And this isn't just a unique story with one country. This is a, a global phenomenon. And so even though you might have things intuitively say, well, you know, more, more debt and, and more deficits would lead to people demanding a higher risk premium, a higher interest rate on uh, lending money to governments. That's true. But if all those things are tethered together and they're all doing the same thing at the same time on a relative basis, you know, what is the alternative? Where, where would, you know, a risk-free rate of return in a sovereign debt instrument be achieved? And if all those rates are interest, you know, are low, then that's sort of the paradigm that you're in. It's sort of the TINA. There is no alternative there. Right now, we happen to have real um, rates that are higher on sovereign debt, meaning above inflation. And that may last for some period of time. But I suspect over time, the Japanification phenomenon will, will take effect and we'll, we'll end up in the, in the continued cycle of, of some lower growing growth numbers. Um, Look, the, the numbers today, to th this week, you know, is so far has been a fairly quiet week as far as economic data. It doesn't mean that there aren't important things happening in the world. There are. Uh, but from a data point perspective, we went through more last week. There is uh, uh, initial jobless claims out tomorrow that, uh, that I'll be able to walk through and uh, see if the employment picture is changing at all. And then we'll have a revision to CPI on Friday. And so I think markets will be more focused um, on that. And again, we'll have some more earnings that continue to come out, um, which have been largely uh, to the upside. Um, but all that to say, I, I uh, have enjoyed being with you again here this evening. Uh, thanks for reading. Thanks for listening. And reach out with your questions, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Mm -hmm.